Okay, are we good, Mike? And it's uh, recording now, thank you. Okay, Mike, we're recording? Okay, recording is resumed. And I've already spoken quite a bit about Tom, so I'm not going to redo all the intro now, but I bring you my good friend, Tom Cox. Thank you. Super, thank you, Richard. Thank you all for being here. Uh, there are few things more important, in my opinion, than doing the work necessary to achieve electoral success in order to advance and preserve the cause of liberty. That's why I'm so pleased to offer this particular presentation with you today. One of the things that our opponents have been very good at is using and misusing power to advance their agenda. What I'm gonna show you here are a set of steps you can take, a set of mindsets you can adopt to allow you to show up in the public sphere as a champion of liberty and as somebody that voters want to vote for, that people want to follow. And the more the Alinskyites attack you with their Alinsky tactics, the better you're gonna look when you respond the way I described. Okay, first a bit about me. Richard gave a, a brief introduction earlier. I'll recap that. I was a LPO candidate for governor of the state of Oregon in 2002. It remains a highlight of my life. And I only did it because Richard badgered me into doing it. He used a series of different arguments. And ultimately I said, okay, how hard can it be? Which is what I usually say. It's, it's similar to hold my beer uh, in terms of words one says right before committing to a course of action that in retrospect, you may or might not have done. Uh, I'm so glad I ran because of the growth experiences that I had in the process of submitting myself to the electoral process and learning about it. Uh, I went on, apparently I did well enough that the Republicans then asked me to be their write-in candidate for state treasurer several years later. So uh, they must have been, I guess, equal parts annoyed and impressed or something. What I want to talk to you about today uh, comes down to three buckets of information. The first is, what are the tactics of Saul Alinsky? I won't detail them all. It, he's wrote a book about it. That book was distributed by some pro-freedom groups uh, not that many years ago. It, it has some very clever pieces to it, but I want to focus on you as a candidate uh, or you as a spokesperson for a ballot initiative or you as someone in the public sphere who may come under attack by people you and skiite tactics. And if and when that happens, uh, and I'd like you to assume that it will, I want you to plan for the problems of success. Uh, if you are successful as a candidate and attract attention and votes, uh, people who don't want liberty and don't want limited government will absolutely attack you with whatever they can do. And that will include these tactics. Uh, preparing now will be really, really good for you. So what are the tactics of Alinsky? Uh, let me summarize. He focused on uniting neighborhood groups around a particular set of behaviors and gave them a common enemy to hate and attack. Now, when you phrase it that way, it actually doesn't sound all that virtuous, which is why leftists who love Alinsky don't want to talk about this aspect. It's all about, oh, he brought people together. Yeah, he brought them around hating somebody. Uh, not about a positive vision, not about uh, building actual relationships, just uh, here's a common enemy, we must hate them, we must attack them. And he gave them a set of techniques for trying to amplify their capabilities. Some of those techniques are effective and some can even be co-opted by the forces of liberty. I think it's fair to critique Alinsky for not helping create real relationships between individuals or groups. And he took no responsibility for fomenting hate. He did get some results in the short term. Uh, and I, I think it was Milton who said, uh, a wise man can gain more wisdom from an idle pamphlet than a fool can learn from studying Holy Scripture. 
Uh, if we are wise, we can look at Alinsky and glean some useful things from his techniques. Uh, but that would be a seminar for another day. Here's what Alinskyites do uh, and, and how you'll see them. If you're attacked by Alinskyites, they will, number one, try to turn you personally into the scapegoat of their grievances. They will, number two, seek to isolate you. They will, number three, seek to ridicule you and goad you into overreacting. Uh, and since most of us aren't particularly practiced at being personally attacked and ridiculed uh, at volume, you know, it's easy to overreact. Uh, they like to stick with the tactics they're people to know and are good at. They like to use vague threats, actually trained by on that. Uh, that way, people's imagination fills in all the empty spaces. So they would rather threaten the boycott than actually organize and carry out a boycott. And you can imagine if your employer, say, is threatened with a boycott because of you, because you are the embodiment of evil, uh, you know, your employer might dump you, potentially. Uh, or you might get otherwise uh, kicked out. Let's see, uh, Timothy points out that the local audio in the conference room is feeding out to the Zoom audience. So if you guys can mute, there we go. Now, can you still hear me? I hope. Okay, great. Uh, yes, we can still hear you. Great. Uh, Bambi, Timothy, thank you so much. Uh, as I was saying, what they'll do is they much prefer vague threats because that uses the imagination of the, uh, the victim against them. Uh, it's just like in horror movies, right? The monster under the bed is much scarier than when the monster comes out from under the bed. Uh, and so obviously the counter pressure is prepare people for that and make them follow through on all of their threats before you take their threat seriously. But I promise you, a threatened boycott is terrifying to a retailer but an actual boycott that leads to a 2% drop in sales is trivial. And it would show how toothless they are. That's why they'd much rather threaten than carry that out. Right. Number six, they will try to keep the pressure on you constantly while varying tactics within the bounds of what the people are good at. So they'll go from one kind of street protest to a different kind of street protest to one kind of vandalism to a different kind of vandalism. Or one kind of ad hominem attack to another. Now here's the responses that do not work. And uh, these are all easy to do. Uh, don't fall for them. Uh, so don't play into their hands. Number one, if you embrace being the scapegoat of their grievance by replying as if you were in fact solely responsible for what's going on. Um, I won't point out any particular politicians who are inclined to take on more uh, power and responsibility than is actually theirs. Uh, and you also don't want to understate your role. And so like, well, so I, I'm just an elected official. I don't actually do anything. That would be terrible. But don't let them scapegoat you. Right? If, if you know, you're a senator and it's like, oh, you single-handedly passed this. Actually, this passed with a two-thirds majority and I collaborated with these other people. Uh, and I'm very proud of having been a part of an entire team that did this. So yeah, don't, don't let them scapegoat you by pretending you're solely responsible. Don't also don't respond as an individual without support. That means they've isolated you. So you and or your team need to mobilize other people to respond on your behalf. Uh, and that can be things like um, having your employer, if they try to get you fired, have your employer publicly say, uh, you know, we evaluate our workers on the merits of their work. And Fred here has done an exemplary job here at work. We're proud of him for being involved in politics, whether we agree with every detail of his policies or not. Uh, and we will absolutely not allow a mob to dictate what our employment practices are. Uh, and you wouldn't want that in your workplace either, would you? And if you can get your employer, let's say it's your employer or, or who are your key clients, to be prepared for this, uh, so much the better. Never respond as an individual. Don't 
respond to ridicule at all, and especially don't respond by overreacting. Um, the last thing you want to do is be the next Richard Nixon, repeating the allegations against him by saying, I am not a crook. Okay, when, when someone says that, what's the first thing you think? You think, oh, he sounds like a crook saying that. So there's the, you, you get the idea. Um, don't repeat the accusation in your denial and don't simply deny it. Uh, you're, you're, you're playing their game. And if you get flustered and angry and you want people to understand your point of view and what's wrong with these people, they don't understand me. If only they understood me here, I'll talk, I'll explain. I'll explain more, I'll explain at length. When you're explaining, you're losing. I'll repeat that. When you're explaining, you're losing because this is not a conversation between you and another human being where if you explained it and they understood you, then there might be an advance in human knowledge or relationship. This is performance theater in public. And it goes by the rules of theater. Don't remain on the defensive and don't just respond to their initiatives. Don't go quiet until the next attack and then respond ineffectually to their attack and then go quiet again and wait for them to attack and then you respond. No, 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 no. There's a, uh, uh, something called the OODA loop. I should probably get an illustration for this, but just draw it for yourself right now. OODA, those three letters in a circle. And the first O stands for orient. Some of you are familiar with the work of uh, uh, the author of this concept, uh, fighter pilot, American fighter pilot. And uh, Timothy knows, Timothy responds, Ra on the OODA loop. OODA uh, is the reason why American fighter pilots were dominant for decades. Because they were trained to orient on what's happening in the world. I'm sorry, observe what's happening in the world. Here's the first O, observe. Second is orient, figure out what does that mean? D is decide what to do about what it means. And then A is to act on the decision you just made. And Timothy says, it's not just pilots, it's actually all, all levels of leadership. It's a great model. I teach it to, uh, in my leadership classes all the time, that you need to be rapidly moving through that loop. And here's where this shows up as an Alinsky tactic, is when they attack you and you're confused and surprised because you weren't expecting this, it takes you forever to observe and orient. You can't even decide what to do, let alone carry it out. And then they're doing something else to you, and now you're back to observing again. And you're stuck in paralysis, uh, the analysis uh, paralysis, trying to figure out what, what is this? And, and it's, it's terrible, it's no fun. If however, you're prepared for it, if you maybe rehearsed it and practiced it, I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. Uh, when they attack you, hopefully your campaign manager or your, your allies have maybe held a, a training on this. This might be a great way for giving up the training possibly uh, is to, have some mock attacks so when it happens you're not shocked and surprised and you can quickly orient realize what's happening decide what to do and act rapidly um, so what doesn't work is remaining defensive right they've got the initiative they're doing what they want to you and you're just stuck responding much better to seize the initiative start doing things that they have to respond to including uh, some very specific tactics we'll get into in a second don't allow vague threats into your imagination. Do not let them set up shop in your head. Any threat they make or any threat they seem to make, doubt it, question it. We're gonna boycott, da 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 da, -da. Uh, Okay, so there's a, a, a line from Shakespeare where someone says, I can call monsters from the vasty deep. And the response came, well, so can I. And so can any man, but do they come when you do call them? And that should be our stance. If they want to say, oh, well, we're going we're gonna to have a boycott if you don't you know, censor him, silence him, blah, blah, blah. So I don't think you can do it. Prove it. I'm not going to knuckle under the threats and, and get people who are supporting you to similarly be dubious about their threats. They love the vague threat. Make them carry them out make them actually follow through. It's much harder, much harder for them. And then if they don't execute well, it totally robs them of credibility. So it sucks up all the resources. Don't let the pressure wear you down. 
If you start letting the pressure wear you down, it's bad. It's bad. Right. And as Timothy points out, absolutely correctly, whoever's got the faster tempo, see if you go through the OODA loop faster than the other person, you're taking action before they've decided what to do. And when you take action, you change the environment. And now they have to observe all over again and reorient. And then you do something else to them. And then they have to re-reorient. And now you're the one taking effective action and they're stuck in the OODA loop. Or if you're slow, they're taking effective action and you're stuck. So speed and preparation are critical, absolutely key. So I told you what doesn't work. Here's what you need to do instead. And we'll talk about these at some length and we've got some examples and stories to show you. Um, these responses can work. I'm not guaranteeing that they're gonna work, but they could, um, and they're worth a try. And this may be the best. This is a, a part of reframing. It's not the only reframe, but it's one of them. It's respond to the values underlying their grievance by agreeing with it and pointing out what you're already doing to help. You know, if they say that, oh, you know, Fred here, he's trying to destroy education by attacking teachers, when all you've done is question overpaying unionized teachers who don't teach and have administrative roles but teaching credentials. And so they call them teachers, but they don't actually teach any classes and they're wildly overpaid and there's too many of them. Uh, and it's like, oh, he's attacking education. Okay, what's the value? The value there is education, which is not directly related to government schools, by the way. Education and schooling are two different, two different things. And government schools are a third thing after that. You say, you know, I, my opponents are saying that, you know, they are concerned about education. And I agree. <gasps> he agrees with his opponents. I agree that education is profoundly important, too important to waste our precious dollars on ineffective teachers who don't actually teach any classes. And then boom, back on your point. And you point out what you're already doing that serves the value that they appear to be espousing. And behind every position is a value and we fight over positions, but our values are often in common. When you articulate what you and your opponents have in common as values and what the audience all values as well, you sound like a statesman. You, sa you sound like a uniter, not a divider, so to speak. At and it plays very, very well. And the press loves that. Makes for good sound bites. The audience likes it, maddens your opposition, totally infuriates them, which is worth doing as well. Uh, and this, again, this is the kind of thing that takes practice, but behind every uh, position is a value. And while we are divided on positions, we're often united on values. And that's a great way to talk about things. And then people find out that, well, I don't agree with your position, Cox, but gosh, you're, you're totally right. Or how can you be so right on values and so wrong on position? <sighs> but they don't hate you now, right? Because we agree on the importance of education for our children in the future. And uh, I'll acknowledge that, yes, I, I don't have my uh, OODA graphic up for this and I should have, but oh well, next time uh, we'll, we'll do this again. If you do a quick Google search on ODA, there's a very good write-up in Wikipedia. Um, let's say, talk about values. Number two, humorously decline to be made out as all powerful. Like when they try to make, you are the center of dysfunction, you are the cause, the one and only cause. If only we got rid of Fred. It's like, well, hey, much as I love to be made out as all powerful, comma, my, my wife will inform you that I'm not, that I, but on chain. Or, you know, the, the truth is, uh, you know, influential as I like to imagine I am, uh, this policy came from a uh, uni unanimous vote of a committee. And I absolutely was in favor of it. And I'd like to imagine I swayed the other members. You get the idea. Always use good humor. The more you're ridiculed, the more you want to smile, the more you want to laugh. Uh, Abe Lincoln was attacked. Someone said he was two-faced. That was, that was the literal accusation made against him. And he said to an audience, you know, my opponent has said that I am two-faced. And I, I, I ask you with total candor, look upon me. If I had a second face, would I be wearing this one? Because he wasn't terribly handsome there. And of course, that's funny. 
and it doesn't reply to the essence of the criticism about him being maybe duplicitous or dishonest. It was the literal two things. It's funny. And it shows that you're not bothered. And people like leaders who aren't uh, overly sensitive, prickly, taking offense at everything, taking everything personally, easily discomfited by their opponents. Good humor shows that you're relaxed, shows that you're confident. Uh, and it also can show that you're listening, you are paying attention, you're not ignoring it. The best tactic of all may be to reframe. It's connected to point number one, but it's broader than that. Uh, a reframe is where you take many, but not all of the same facts and you offer a different interpretation of it. Uh, and I'd like to, to take a minute and throw this open, especially to the folks on the Zoom call who have access to their keyboards and can type things in without interrupting each other or, or the audience in the, in the theater, in, in the meeting room, is think about some examples that you've admired where a politician or, or some kind of public figure has reframed a problem or a situation to their own advantage. That one side, the other side has set things up a certain way and the response has been actually, uh, maybe not in so many words to say, no, no, you're thinking about that all wrong. Here's what's really going on. And so it's not a fight about facts, it's a fight about what the facts mean. Uh, an example of doing that humorously was uh, Reagan in the debate with Mondale where it had been clear that he was going to be attacked on his age. Reagan was you know, one of the older presidents uh, ever elected or reelected. And so before his opponent could bring it up, he said, I am not going to make age a factor in this race. I will not exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and immaturity. And even Mondale laughed at that. Uh, Timothy has an example of education funding. And he points out that rich people, especially politicians who are often well off, big shock there, have the option to send their kids to private school and often do. And so they leave that option open to themselves. They're just denying school choice to those less well off than themselves. So, you know, a lot of the same facts are in play, but we're looking at them differently. You know, is gun control about reducing you know, criminal use of guns? Or is it about preserving the right of individuals to protect themselves? Same facts, but we're looking at it from very different perspectives. The reframe is your most powerful weapon in the face of Alinsky criticism. They're trying to make it personal. You don't let it be personal. They're trying to say that you're a wicked person, you're trying to harm society. You say, actually, the correct way to interpret this is, and you offer your interpretation. We'll probably get into some more of that in the Q&A. A terrific way to respond to an Alinsky personal attack. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, before I get on, let me back up here. Uh, Andrew points out that when Donald Trump was criticized for his uh, treatment of women, he pointed to Clinton and Clinton's history with women, which was a very effective counterexample. Uh, Timothy points out that impoverished areas generally of higher minority populations that are in greatest need of self-defense against both institutional violence and criminal violence. They're the ones who are most at risk when they're denied their right to self-defense. So again, terrific reframes. And hammering on that is great. If the other side doesn't want to see it that way, well, of course they don't want to see it that way. But the audience can be made to see it that way. The third-party counterattack is one of my favorite techniques, um, in part because it's so hard for the other side to anticipate, and it's often impossible for them to respond. And it lets you hijack the news cycle. So there was an example where uh, an elected politician had proposed a budget that included a, uh, a, a cuts uh, to some programs or 
you know, a slower increase is framed as a cut. It's like, it's supposed to increase 4% every year. Anything less than that's a cut. It's like, what? Even, even accepting the word cut is nonsense. His opponent criticized his budget as being an, uh, a holocaust for the schools. Use the word holocaust. Now, the, the, the worst possible response is to say, it's not a holocaust, and now you're repeating the word, and you're keeping the word alive, and that's absolutely the worst thing to do. Um, the third priority counterattack came when his campaign manager got in touch with some, a conservative Jewish group who immediately publicly attacked the opponent for misusing and trivializing the Holocaust by using it in this, in this fashion. And that it was disrespectful to the memory of those who died in the actual Holocaust to be using it in this cheap and tawdry way. And they denounced him and criticized it. And the guy's backpedaling and apologizing. And now the newspapers are running the story of how this guy's being attacked by the Jewish uh, group and for his, you know, his, his Holocaust denialism or, or whatever spin they put on it. So you don't have to say anything to that. If, so the third parties who can counterattack, you know, pick on a word, pick on a phrase, pick on an implication, uh, find a way in which that person is uh, out of bounds, outside the mainstream of society, uh, poorly reflective of the interests of our, of our, of our politics. That's terrific. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of good self-care routines. Good home life, uh, excellent regimen of exercise and, and diet, really good habits. Um, if you're going to campaign, you can let the campaign take over your life. And political campaigns are one of these phenomena in the world where there's literally always more that could be done than you can do. Right? You are never going to leave the office in a political campaign, whether it's for uh, getting yourself elected or passing a ballot initiative or anything else. You will never leave the office having completed all of the work that could have been done that day. You will never, ever finish. All you can do is pick which things to get in trouble with over for not doing. There's always another call you could have made. There's always another place you could have visited. There's always another something you could have done. You're just going to have to control it. You're going to have to manage it your habits will get you through. So it is like being a warrior monk. You've got to have incredible self-discipline when you get into these campaigns to not let it eat you alive. And good self-care routines will keep you relaxed and happy, which is exactly how you wanna show up when these attacks occur. And probably the last thing you can do is inoculate yourself through preparation. And I've got a whole second slide here on specific preparations you can do. How do you prepare in advance to face this kind of attack? And the first thing you can do is know how you'll be attacked before you're attacked and know how you'll respond. Not necessarily verbatim, but be familiar. Uh, 2002, I ran for governor of Oregon. Uh, we had not yet legalized marijuana in the state of Oregon. It was absolutely uh, normal to expect that I would be attacked uh, on, you know, Cox is going to legalize drugs. And that's exactly what happened. Cox has his way, we'll have legalized heroin. Okay. Uh, I should not have been surprised by that. And I was not surprised by that because I fully expected that because that's how people always attack libertarians. Just expect to be attacked the way they always attack uh, people like you or how they attack other people, whether they're like you or not. Uh, and in particular, A, where are you vulnerable to tropes? Some of you may not be familiar with the word trope. Uh, a trope is a little like a meme. A trope is a unit of storytelling. Uh, so a trope is the, uh, uh, the rich uncle who you don't remember who dies and leaves you a million dollars. And that's the opening scene of the show, right? The, the rich relative who, who dies off screen and leaves you money. Or 
uh, uh, grandfatherly older teacher who befriends the young outcast, right? The, the Yoda figure or the Obi-Wan Kenobi figure. Um, you know, the, the damsel in distress trope. So you get the idea. There's, there's websites devoted to these. Um, most attacks follow the line of the tropes that are popular either uh, in the, the mass of the population or on the other side, whatever side you're on. So if you're a limited government person, you're probably going up against socialists. And they've got a set of tropes that are very real to them. And, you know, all capitalists are evil and greedy and selfish and destructive. So if you're in business, you're probably an evil, destructive, wicked capitalist. Uh, or, you know, you're a lawyer, they'll pack you off to being a lawyer. If you're a doctor, I'm not sure what they'll do. Uh, but there, there's certain things that line up with easy, simple stereotypes that are readily available, you're probably going to be attacked along those lines. Whether it's your ethnicity, whether it's your gender, whether it's your profession, uh, certain values you've got. You know, if you're pro-life, uh, then you want to enslave women, enslave their bodies. Uh, you get the idea. Don't be surprised by this. You know, if you're calling everybody a racist, don't imagine they're not going to call you a racist. They'll find an excuse for it. They don't need reasons. So look for that. And well before you were actually attacked, rehearse it. Number two is get good at not taking it personally. There's a skill unto itself because most of us don't get attacked all that much in our daily lives. And so being attacked feels weird and bad. And there's some very specific things you can do around that. Uh, you can rehearse, uh, you can get improv training. Uh, one of the most useful things I ever did in helping myself with uh, both public speaking and uh, uh, political debate was theater. Not theater in the sense of pretending to be another character, but theater in the sense of being comfortable on stage and having people stare at you. And maybe not really comfortable, comfortable, but at least not freaked out by it. Uh, and, and most of us, you know, the number one fear of Americans is public speaking, and the number two fear of Americans is dying. I mean, seriously, people are more afraid of speaking than of dying. They'd rather be in the casket than giving the, the, the speech in front of the casket. It's that bad. Uh, you're going to have to get over that. And I'll mention to Richard here that uh, it's possible that improv training could be uh, a good uh, Western liberty network. Another thing you can do in advance is recruit lots of allies well in advance, make friends, get connected, do people favors, get to know their stuff. If they've got a ballot initiative, go help them on it. If they've got a candidate, help them on it. Again, assuming that's compatible with your values and interests. Because the more allies you have, the more possible angles of third party ally counterattack are possible. I'm going to pause here a moment and point out what I'm, I'm not saying have your third party allies initiate unfair attacks against anybody. Uh, that's being a Linskyite, and I don't, I don't favor that. I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's good. Legitimate uh, criticisms of an opponent absolutely are in bounds, right? The public has a right to know who they're electing. And if you've got an opponent who's got you know, three convictions for DUI and is a white collar criminal, even an accused white collar criminal, I, I think voters should know that. And then if they vote him in, at least they voted him with their eyes open. I mean, there's nothing about Trump that Trump voters didn't know. They voted for him anyway. As opposed to a candidate who gets treated so gently by the press that no one actually knows what his weaknesses and flaws are until they're already in office. So yeah, absolutely fair-minded or, or honest criticism, totally in bounds. So I'm not saying recruit allies to launch uh, unfair, unreasonable personal attacks. Don't, but find those allies. It's one of the things I think conservatives are actually kind of bad at, limited government folks. We tend to quote, want to be left alone, unquote. Uh, our counterparts on the left love collective action. They love working together in groups. 
They love alliances between groups and other groups and alliances between alliances of groups and big meetings and joint statements and they just love it. Uh, and so it's naturally easier for them to play that game. But at the same time, if you're playing in the world of politics, what you're, what you're attempting to do is put yourself and your ideas forward to the body of the people to say, hey, I think here's a good direction for all of us to go in. That's a group activity you're engaged in. And if you can't make allies before you go up, in, up on stage, uh, you probably don't deserve a lot of support because the politics game is about group support. So this is a really, really good thing for you to do in general. Recruit allies, find people whose values are compatible with yours, who take positions that are at least reasonably compatible with yours, find ways to help them on their ballot initiatives, find ways to you know, go out to the world with joint statements, um, invite them to talk to your voters, invite them to make a pitch to your voters so you'll they'll, they'll let you in front of their audiences. Find ways to work together. Uh, this is probably one of the easiest things that the limited government movement could do much better. Uh, it would pay off dramatically. Another thing you could do to prepare in advance is reframing. Uh, and I'm going to actually make uh, for a little group exercise here uh, folks in the in the big room together and the, those folks here on zoom uh, i'm going to invite each of you to participate slightly differently uh, we're going to throw out some some criticisms and the reframe is to answer actually that's why i'm the better candidate or the best candidate and the game is to figure out not necessarily a particularly good or persuasive thing but anything at all just to get the, the, the juices flowing on how to reframe almost anything. Uh, many of these will be bad, but that's okay. We're not trying to be good. We're trying to practice. So what might be a reframe of, you know, Fred there uh, has never held public office. And okay, never held public office. Well, that's why I'm the best candidate, dot, 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 because why? And then just type in to chat how you spin never held, never held public office before is actually positive. And if he's quick on the keyboard, but I won't read it out loud quite yet. But let's practice this together a little bit. And I invite, you know, Kathy, Sally, Katie, Elaine, Dan, Brian, Bambi, Jackie, all of you, give it a shot. If you want to do what Tim's doing and answer two or three times, that's totally cool. Alice, Bob, Kim, Dimitri, Debbie, Kathy, love to have your, your thoughts, Carolyn, Michelle. Very nice, Jennifer. I'm not a career politician. Now, that could be double edged because some people actually like experienced politicians. They, they feel that there's some, you know, some advantage to actually understanding the, the problem space or the the domain. Uh, Kathy likes to say, I'm transparent, which may or may not be a direct response, but it's a great thing to say. Uh, Andrea, I'll bring fresh ideas. Ooh, very nice. Jane says, I have real world experience. I'm bringing in a new perspective. Yeah. Timothy says, not part of the mess. The problems are created by the people who've been in office. We have, we have one here from the floor. Yes. Um, wow, I got so nervous standing up now. <laughs> Probably just the idea of um, recognizing that just because it's been done before doesn't mean that we can't try something new. And right. um, if when somebody's been in politi politics for so long, they live in the world of politics. But when you're a citizen stepping forward for the first time, you are of the people and by and for the people. And that's why they would be made a better candidate. Yeah, baby. Oh, that was great. Who's, who was that? Um, that was me. 
And <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That was Reza Piatkov. Reza. That got is another a, one. We've got another one here from the floor. Good, good. Keep them flowing. And if you're How at home about, on a keyboard, uh, keep typing. Okay. How about uh, independent voice for the voters of District 40? I love it. Absolutely. Independent voice. Um, saw you first, saw you next. Unlike my worthy opponent, I've not been bought and paid for by the special interest. That's why I'm the better candidate. But on King, yeah, you go. Nice round of applause for that one. Got another one here for you. Okay, again, say your name first before you give your... your... I'm Suzanne Gallagher with Parents' Rights in Education. Suzanne. I would say the reason I'm running is because of what my opponent has created. <laughs> and it's obvious who's responsible for everything that is taking place in Oregon. There you go. So every one of them is guilty. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, we're gonna switch now. Now remember, we're nonpartisan today. Um, do you okay, wanna I'm interject a Zoom comment or two before we let's continue do, on the floor? Let's do a different reframe. So we've done, okay, never never held public office. Maybe that one's an easy, we're used to that one. Um, what if you or your, or your candidate that might be you're helping somebody else. Let's say they were um, convicted of a crime 20 years ago, nonviolent crime. And that's why that person's a better candidate. Not a fashion crime. Uh, possibly fashion crime, but only if it was uh, a misdemeanor or felony. So bell bottoms, for instance. Uh, so you're gonna, you've got either you or the person you're helping uh, and the truth is they, this person was indeed convicted of a crime. Maybe they'd spent less than a year in jail. Uh, a good friend of mine actually would end up in federal prison. I had no idea. Uh, great person, totally trust her. And her backstory was that her boyfriend had used her in his crime. The feds tried to flip her and make her an informant with the threat of jail time for some small stuff if she didn't flip. And she just can't bring herself to lie, so she couldn't be an informant, so she just took the jail time. Less than a year, not a felony, but still, federal prison. Yeah. Okay, let's say that's who our candidate is. Why does that experience, without getting into the depths of it, why does that make them the better candidate? Brief Here we go. Hi, Stacy Ann with KSLM Radio, and I would say, isn't it refreshing to know that from that experience, they've turned their life around and they can help others in their day-to-day -day experience not make the same mistake they've made. Yeah, yeah, someone who's learned. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, a really good related one is, and we can use this almost everywhere, is here's someone who's been on both sides of policymaking, not just passing the law, but being subjected to it. And that's a depth of understanding most of us can't bring. We have another one here. Yeah. Jeanette Shada. Um, hey, Jeanette. Hi, how you doing, Tom? Great. Um, we all make mistakes, and so if you want to cast those first stones, then go ahead. But she is the better candidate. Right, better candidate despite. But I want to, let's take it one step further. Better candidate because of having gone to jail. Okay. Have another one here for you, Tom. Hello, Tom. This is Joe Ray Perkins. Hey, Joe Ray. So how about because of their experience, they can tell you where the corruption is in the judicial system and how they had a plea bargain in order to save their lives and protect their family. There you go. Got one more here. Remember, these are all rough drafts. Please don't commit that Paul, you're going to quote any of us. Paul Metzler. This minor infraction from years ago shows the voters of the district the deep understanding of what some of them and their families have gone through. While their, their response to adversity may not have been right, they've learned from it and they've been through hard times like you. Yeah, nice. Any from Zoom pop up? I think that the Zoom folks have been listening like I've been listening. Okay, got another one there here on, from the floor. Right. Hi, Tom, my name is John Lapsley. Hey, John. I think the, uh, the quickest one I would do in this case is say, 
I've been on the inside. I've seen that side of the justice system and the penal system. There are many things that could be fixed, and I've lived the experience. I could come and help make those changes. Nice. Yeah, it's a unique experience that gives me perspective no one else has. We're at about five minutes, Tom. Super. So let's go ahead. I love the practice. I love the energy. We're going to cut that short, but I think we can definitely uh, tap this again uh, and do more reframe practice. Um, another one is practice redirecting. Now, this is something you see politicians do constantly, and it works. It deserve, it, you can totally practice it, and you should. Um, practice redirecting. Now, this could be when you're attacked or even when you're asked a question. You can say, actually, what we should be talking about is, and then talk about what you want to talk about. Totally legit. And it's much more effective than just staying on the topic of what the other person's trying to, to, to talk about or attack you with. OK, that was it for my prepared remarks. Uh, great job on stepping in for uh, the interactive uh, re reframe on the fly. Well done. A lot of creativity. And Reza, I think that you admitting you were nervous and getting up anyway was very courageous. And I'd like to hear a round of applause for Reza one more time. Absolutely. She's an up and comer, I can tell you that. I could tell that too. And by the way, if you're nervous and speak anyway, everybody loves that because they're nervous for you because they don't want to be up there. They're scared. They wouldn't stand up in front of the group, and you did. Um, so that's that's really super. Alice points out that Obama was a master of not answering questions. And there, you know, if you can get over your revulsion, uh, there's a lot to be learned watching some very practiced politicians play this game. They're, they're winning for a reason. Uh, you don't want to copy all aspects of what they do, but there's some style aspects, part of the theater of it, if you will, the directing of attention. Uh, those those things can be harnessed for good, right? They're not, oh, they, they work because they work. You know, magicians on stage, they, miss, they direct your attention and they do magic. Politicians get on stage and they direct your attention and they achieve policy outcomes. We can achieve virtuous policy outcomes using human nature, including our own and that of others in a responsible and ethical way. Tom, we've got a few more minutes. Lunches aren't sure. here yet. So if you okay. want to keep going, please do. Okay, super. So, uh, oh, we're getting a lot of requests in here for doing another exercise. <laughs> okay. And, 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 Joe, and Joe Ray has a question again. Sure, Joe Ray, go ahead. Yeah. So this is on the number five, practice the redirecting. Yeah. And I've heard this from many voters, and I'm going to guess that those on Zoom and in this room would agree that when a candidate or a politician is asked a question regarding X, yeah. um, they want to know that's what they're asking about, not... Well, that's a great question, but I want to talk about why, it's, and yes. and it's very it's very frustrating, and I and I hear more voters getting frustrated with that candidate or that politician because they're refusing to answer a direct question. So, how do you redirect right. and answer the question simultaneously? Right. Uh, so, what I think for that one, we're going to want to back up to prior slide. Let's see one I was referring to when I said um, respond to values, number one on this, on this page, back to that. So uh, let's say that, you know, your opponent claims that you would legalize heroin, Mr. Cox. If you were elected governor, you would legalize heroin. Uh, I would say, look, I, I, I can understand it that my opponent doesn't understand drug policy in the slightest. And so he might imagine that that's true. And I hope the voters are smart enough not to succumb to raw fear mongering. And, and the truth is, uh, the war on drugs is a failure. Uh, and uh, the governor has no power to unilaterally legalize any drug. Uh, I'll tell you what position I will take. This is the position I took at the time. This said, actually happened in your case. Yeah, this actually happened in 2002. I said, because I needed to, you know, reassure voters that I wasn't going to do something that the majority of voters actually didn't want. Uh, I said, look, I don't trust the legislature, even if they gave me uh, a bill to legalize something. Uh, I think they'd fill it with, you know, poison pills and, and secret junk that would make it worse than it is. Uh, I will only accept a change in policy from the voters themselves by initiative. And I will veto any 
law that legalizes any drug because I'm, I'm the legislature is going to get it right. Uh, and I would encourage the people through the initiative process to, in, to end the war on drugs in a way that works, you know, truly works for the voters of Oregon. And so would I legalize heroin? Well, I gave a kind of complex answer, but it was mostly couched in the values of respecting the voters, the war on drugs is a failure, uh, I won't do anything unilateral. It wasn't a great answer, but it kept me out of the soup. Uh, and if I'd answered it badly, I would have been sidelined for the rest of the campaign. I would have been the drug legalizing heroin fanatic uh, and not a real, you know, a legitimate, plausible candidate. We have another question, or I guess it's a reaction on the redirect. I was in a state hearing once where the only people that had testified were from the solar companies about raising uh, the sweet deals for the solar companies. And it would be on the backs of all of the rate payers yep. getting electricity that did not have solar power. <laughs> and so I testified through my involvement with Oregon Citizen Lobby um, on behalf of the ratepayers and that it, it was just unfair to keep making power more and more burdensome, burdensome portion of our budgets. And one of the um, legislators, <laughs> she says, she, she asked to ask a question at the end of my testimony and she says, do you not think climate change is a is a valuable um, and worthy project that the Oregon legislature should be handling. Um, I personally am willing to pay more for my electricity to, in order to ensure that we did more for climate change. So I replied, um, well, the question isn't whether I'm willing to pay more or whether you're willing to pay more. And that's Very wonderful nice. that you're willing to pay more. The question is, are you going to require every single rate payer, including all of our um, uh, senior citizens, and keep in mind that people born in 1953 was the largest group in our history to go uh, to retire, and 1954 was the next largest, and this was after these people had retired. And you're trying to, to make their overhead even more expensive, because really, if you valued climate change, and anyone who values climate change has plenty of uh, NGOs that they could donate money to, but that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about taking it out of our paychecks. Nice, nice redirect. And Tom, if, if you would like to wrap up, our food yeah. has arrived, and uh, um, but this has been fantastic. This has the been most great. dangerous place for any speaker is between the audience and their food. <laughs> so I will say uh, it's great to see and hear from so many folks I know and so many that I am just getting to know. Grace, Joe Ray, all of you. This is a, a lifelong fight we're engaged in. And the skills we just talked about in terms of learning how to withstand heat in the public arena, to withstand attacks, including bad faith attacks, and to do it with a good heart and with good humor. These are great skills to have in general. And they're absolutely vital for us moving into this next decade of struggle. Uh, the left is only going to get more vicious. Uh, they eat each other up, not just uh, folks in the middle and on the right. And uh, I think it's the folks in this room who dedicate themselves to learning these skills and mastering these skills. Uh, we're going to make the difference for generations to come. Uh, and it's Western Liberty Network that's going to lead the way. And I'm real proud to uh, to be here talking to you and supporting this organization, supporting each of you. If I can do anything to help any of you uh, in any way, I hope that you'll reach out to me. And I will share with you my contact info on the screen. So thank you very much, Tom. Let's give Tom a hand. I know we appreciate what he did. Excellent work. I want to remind the people watching on Zoom that this will be posted. We're recording this as we go forward, and this will be posted on the westernlibertynetwork.org within the next week, so stay tuned. Tom, uh, you're of course uh, more than welcome to hang out for the rest of the conference, uh, or if you have to go, that's okay too, but this has been fantastic, and I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Yep, very good.
Yeah, Tom's right. You don't want to get between an audience and their lunch. And uh, I've actually made that mistake in my life, but I'm not going to do it this time. Uh, we have pizza. There are three kinds of pizza back there. There's pepperoni, there's cheese, and there are veggie pizzas. Uh, this is all individualized. You take a whole pizza, and uh, the salads are there, and uh, we got, I guess, some water or ice. I'm not sure if there's iced tea or not, but anyway, go ahead and grab your lunch. Now, for people who are on Zoom, um, we are going to take a few moments for people to get their food, but this is a working lunch, and we've got some real good presentations coming up, so I invite you to stay logged into your Zoom. There will be a couple of minutes pause, and then we will start again very shortly. So go ahead and get up and get your food. Thank you very much.